KCRW sponsors include A24, presenting Moonlight, a film chronicling three chapters in the life of a young black man, discovering his identity and experiencing first love as he moves from childhood into manhood. In theaters now. On To The Point, we try to make sense of the policy debates and the political sideshows on the campaign trail. Neither party's agenda really aligns with who its coalition is today. It was the dumbest speech I have ever seen in my life of covering politics. When people walk into a voting booth, at the end of the day, they do say, I really should vote for someone smarter than me. I'm Warren Altney. To The Point has you covered for the 2016 campaign. Find the To The Point podcast on KCRW's iTunes page. From KCRW Santa Monica and KCRW.com, it's The Treatment. Welcome to The Treatment. I'm Elvis Mitchell. It's always fun to have an old friend join us on the show. And Jay Roach has been coming here since Mystery Alaska. Uh, it's been that long now, wow. and he's done a few films in the interim. Awesome Powers, uh, Spy Who Shagged Me, Recount, Meet the <laughs> Parents, Meet the Fuckers, Game Change. His newest film is a terrific look at the life of screenwriter and controversial political thinker Dalton Trumbull, the film is Trumbull starring Brian Cranston. Jay, it's so good to have you back. It is excellent to be back again, man. I love it. Tell the audience a little bit what they're going to see when they see Trumbo. It's a story about a a blacklisted screenwriter who chose not to succumb. You know, he ends up organizing other writers to write under pseudonyms and assumed names and ends up winning two Academy Awards under other people's names and writes Spartacus uh, and finally gets credit on Spartacus uh, and Exodus the same year and helps undo the blacklist. And talk about what attracted you to the material. What what made you want to do this? I... You know, John McNamara, the the screenwriter, and and, uh, this movie, if it doesn't do anything else, should get people talking about uh, how screenwriters are treated in our industry. So I'm always quick to uh, just bring John McNamara's name up, John McNamara, John McNamara, because he wrote a really good screenplay. I'm assuming John McNamara has something to do with the making of the film. (laughs) Uh, He wrote the screenplay, and he did a great job. Michael London, the great producer, uh, brought it to me. I, I was immediately struck by it. We did work on it for a while um, together. And one of the things I, I suggested that he do was get to know the daughters, Nikki Trumbo and Mitzi Trumbo, who are amazing people and who helped us get the feel for what it was like growing up in a house where you had to pretend your father was doing something else, you know, not not reveal what he was doing and, and make sure you didn't answer the phone with the wrong name or, or uh, you know, uh, say the wrong thing that would somehow draw attention to your to your life and they also gave us a lot of the details about how they did organize almost a family business to do uh, black market screenplay trading I think it falls in with something that really runs throughout your work, where be it in fiction work or or nonfiction pieces like this, you tend to be attracted to big personalities, really outsized personalities who live their lives in very extravagant fashions and are kind of buttressed by somebody who's sort of the common sense. In this household, this is why played by Diane Lane, but we can go back to the relationship between Burt Reynolds and and Russell (laughs) Crowe in Mystery Alaska or Mm -hmm. even Austin Powers. I mean, mean, that that happens so much in Game Mm Change. There's that kind of sort of bigger than life person and the sounding board or mm-hmm. an audience an surrogate. audience an audience rep yeah I, I do think that somehow being aware being self-aware of the extraordinariness if you will of the other character if you, if you have a, a kind of audience rep sort of person who's not that extraordinary through which wh- whose point of view you can use to sort of see the other person. It actually gives you license to go even further. In the case of Trumbo and, and also, uh, you know, Brian Cranston, I just I just am in awe of what he did on that film, and I'm working with him again uh, on the LBJ adaptation of the play uh, that was on Broadway. I had seen the LBJ play when we were before we shot Trumbo, and I, I just realized that he is capable of tremendous dynamic range and in a certain situation, if, he, if the whole story was from that point of view, it might get overwhelming. And it's, But to have someone like Diane Lane, and then also to have characters who are his antithesis in a way, uh, Hedda Hopper, played by Helen Mirren, who is his real direct antagonist in the story, but even Louis C.K., who plays one of his buddies, who one of his uh, Hollywood 10 
very left wing, even more left than Trumbo buddies, who is willing to sort of confront him about his own lifestyle and how pure he is as a left, a lefty. You know, to to have uh, the the antithesis of such a big character is really helpful to balance it all out. But it's funny too because in that dynamic that exists between the large and life character and that that kind of Audie Sergey, that should be Elizabeth Hurley or, or Woody Harrelson. But the, these exist. Yeah, Elizabeth Hurley as the every woman in. <laughs> yeah, but they're often looking yeah. at these people and just kind of blinking at them. And and yeah, yeah. but also these these protagonists that you. you tend to be attracted to are people kind of out of time. I mean, literally mm, in the case mm. of Austin Powers, but in Sarah Palin or, or Trumbull, these are all people who kind of harken back to the age just before we meet them. Mm. That's interesting. I, yeah, I hadn't really made all those connections, but particularly in Trumbo's case, he really was almost a throwback to an even earlier time when being a great orator was was an important thing. He he was a, a really good writer. Uh, he probably should have been an actor too, and he actually did play a role in Papillon as the uh, camp, you know, warden or something. But he sort of performed even his ideas when he was just giving speeches. At, at he was very pro union. He gave dozens of of rally speeches for the Writers Guild at the time and for other unions, and he was committed to making sure every word mattered, you know, and he would speak with a kind of theatrical, almost stage presence that I found, in a way, uh, you know, uh, over a long haul could probably drove people around him crazy. But in another way, it made you realize that people who are that passionate about ideas and are willing to step out and and, and articulate them like that, that's a kind of a rare thing. And I, it, it inspired me. You know, I, I wish I had the chutzpah, you know, to, to, uh, to be that outspoken. And I think those kinds of characters, I think because I'm a little lower profile than that, I tend to, uh, to almost have a, a a wish fulfillment. They're like superheroes to me. I, I, I say this with with a certain amount of facetiousness, but I do think Trumbo had a superpower and he was a great writer and he used his his words to take on tremendous opponents, you know, uh, the entire John anti-communist Wayne, yeah, or, uh, you know, movement that was post-war, the part of the Cold War, all the, the, the John Wayne, Hedda Hopper was an even more intense... And took it out uh, of him basically yeah. in, in print. I mean, and she was, we should say Hedda Hopper, for yeah. those who don't know, was the biggest thing. I mean, even though it's in that time when the gossip columns really mattered, and studios were afraid of them. Yeah. I mean, we see her in the film intimidating Louis B. Mayer. That's and, right. She had 35 million readers just in her written stuff alone. She ended up having a television presence and, and a radio presence really. and radio too as well, yeah, of course. And she represented, a, a, I would say, the majority of Americans at the time in a certain way because I, I think I read a poll of, in the research that said that in 1950, something like 60% of Americans thought we were already in World War III. And obviously she was pointing out a uh, in, on the one hand, a true legitimate threat, totalitarian communism was for real. Uh, Soviet Union was already occupied, had occupied Eastern Europe, uh, and, and there was a tremendous sense of, of of Stalin being up to no good. But somehow the, the whole anti-union movement, the liberals, the pro-union people all became, got lumped into a, a, a sort of I don't know what you would call it, just a group of un-Americans. They would, yeah, any, you know, anything that, that was basically what, progressive thinking was yeah. considered to be leftist thinking. And you sort of make that, you, and John McNamara make the case of the film. But also, interestingly, I thought that when we meet Hedda, she offers a rationale in talking about uh, defending her own son that mm-hmm. makes her immediately a sympathetic character. So sure. she's not just a standard villain. No, she she had genuine patriotic feelings. Her her son was in the military, and she thought people who underestimated the threat were naive, and, and if they pushed it, uh, even after they'd been confronted, were, were actually un-American. And so she and people like uh, Ward Bond, Sam Wood, uh, Walt Disney, a, a number of people... Adolf, mind you, there are a whole group yeah, of these people. ...formed the MPA, the, the Motion Picture Alliance for the, the Preservation, Preservation of American, American ideals, ideals, which is such a fantastic name. <laughs> and they met, you know, at the um, the American uh, Legion uh, right there next to um, the Hollywood Bowl. You know, that, that oh. beautiful, it's a beautiful, we shot there later for the LBJ thing. It was a, again, it was a mainstream movement is my point. It wasn't, uh, these guys, Trumbo and the Hollywood 10 were definitely part of a, 
a minority but opinion. But we should say, too, by the way, it's the treatment our old friend Jay Roach is back. His newest film as director is Trumbo. We should say, too, that before World War II, that movement that he represented was really in the forefront of American thinking. Yes, because uh, fascism had been on the rise there were so many groups, anti-fascist groups, that had had uh, gained traction. That, uh, in among the intelligentsia and the and the artists, uh, there were many people who were interested in the Communist Party because they seemed to be at the time. There's the, a big the Warner Brothers film, Mission to Moscow, that's and, yeah. incredibly supportive of all this. Uh, FDR tried to talk more people in Hollywood into making films, friend, f- f- sort of favorable to the Soviet Union, because we were allied with them throughout the, the World Second War II. Second World War II, so, yeah. So it's, it is a different time, and we had to be careful to make sure we set that context. There's a crawl at the beginning that explains that. You get a sense that these guys were at least as much union guys and, and guys just interested in rights for workers and good benefits and a share of whatever was going on with studios. And that painted targets on their backs. Once, they, once the, the Cold War sort of enabled the Red Scare kind of tactic of using fear of one thing to, to round up People represented something else entirely, but you know what I. One thing I admired about these guys is they were very passionate and very capable and articulate people. But they were also good at using wit and uh, and humor and sarcasm, you know, to expose the the hypocrisy of using almost a totalitarian system to shut down what's supposedly something tied to a totalitarian system. They would make up incredibly, uh, you know, good arguments that that they thought would work. And then, of course, they show up at the, at the HUAC hearings and nobody's laughing. <laughs> you know, they're, <laughs> they're making jokes about what they're up to and, and realizing, oh, we we're, we're really are an unpopular group right now. Then this is one of the good things I like about the movie, too. It's about somebody, instead of accused of being a communist, being a communist, yeah. which was, as pointed out in the movie, but we should know anyway, was not illegal. Was not illegal. And and again, mostly in his case was aligned with anti-fascism and, and pro-worker uh, aspects. He, I do think they were sympathetic to, to aspects of, of other communist you know, party planks, but they weren't Stalinist. Trumbo for sure was not a Stalinist. And that, I think, is, is it's hard to see back through Stalin to what communism meant to these guys uh, at, at that time. I, I think it's one thing that inspired me about Trumbo was that he wasn't afraid to talk about politics. It, it's so uncool, unhip generally, I think, in our culture to have any kind of conversation about politics. And I, what he did was made... Uh, talking about politics seem interesting and enjoyable sometimes even and and even okay f- to be filled with a few laughs like he he and his buddies were true smart asses uh, and they they turned his funeral into a roast <laughs> you know they they made fun of his uh his aggressiveness and his stubbornness and while also you know extolling love for the man and that's that's how they talked about their country they loved it but they weren't afraid to criticize it, you know, and they weren't afraid to to find absurdity and, and ridiculousness in some of the things that were going on and pointed out in a kind of entertaining way. So, I, you know, I, I think a storyteller who's who's willing to go so far as he, let's say, as he did in Spartacus, which is probably his most subversive movie. <laughs> it's about a, an uprising of the the oppressed, you know, common man who was who happened to be slaves. It's, so uh, it was hard to argue with, but it was it was uh, about re, you know revolution against the the powers that be, and for that you know Kirk Douglas bravely put his name on it and helped break the blacklist. And it's funny, too, that the, the two guys who actually helped to get him break the blacklist are guys who were just as sort of, in their way, kind of tough to be around as he was. Priminger and Douglas, yeah. We got to watch it with Kirk Douglas, uh, and he he really was so supportive of the film. Okay. He, and he didn't mind the guy playing him. That was one of the hardest parts about making this movie uh, and knowing, you know, that these guys were such icons. But Kirk Douglas is alive, you know, and could come after us. And all he said was, that guy was actually pretty good. I, I really liked him, this guy, uh, Dino Gorman, uh, from New Zealand, who his accent is very not Kirk Douglas. <laughs> and uh, he said, the only thing I wish is that you'd offered me the part. <laughs> Kirk, who's 99, you know. And probably still could have done it. He could have done it, you know, by the way. It's a good time to take a break. My guess is Jay Roach's new film as director is Trumbo. It's the very unhip, the treatment. There's more to come. Stay with us. (laughs) 
wish you could hear KCRW's signature music programming wherever and whenever you want? You can with Eclectic 24. Our ever-expanding all-music stream is available worldwide 24-7 online. You can listen to KCRW's diverse music mix on the go or in the car through your iPhone or Android phone app. KCRW's Eclectic 24, where and when you want it. Check it out. Go to kcrw.com slash eclectic24. Welcome back. I'm still on hip. It's the treatment. My guest is our old friend Jay Roach, whose new film as director is Trumbull. But I do want to get back to this this idea of you being a, attracted to characters who mm. are incredibly charismatic. And in some way, almost, like I said, these, these people who are also furiously over-articulate mm-hmm. um, and, and they, who love talking. I, I do that these this is so consistently run through both the 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 looks at nonfiction pieces and and mm-hmm. and your fiction pieces as well. I just think that that linkage is really fascinating to yeah, me. Yeah, I wonder what the psychology about that is. I've always had a an approach avoid thing on in speaking in public. I, I've had horrible stage fright for most of my life. I've actually weirdly lately been getting over that. I think it's probably just age and uh, not caring as much. <laughs> but, but I, you know, for and yet I would all in school. I was a kind of in high school. I was sort of a student politician to force myself out. And then I taught after USC. I taught for about seven years part time. And I would always try to force myself out. But I, it was always the other guys, the funny guys, the the stand up guys, the the political people that I admired who inspired me. And because I, I, I think it is something when you have i'm very passionate about things i care about and i believe in and i'm particularly actually passionate about our country and our you know our political situation and i i the thing i loved about trumbo for example is he could speak about political issues and make them not just important and valid but they were it made you care about these issues i guess what i was going to say is that this attraction to these kind of characters, really, that abrasion that they create is really the heart of drama. If drama's about conflict, these are people who, again, I think they're actually, I can't think of a case that in some way or another, they're not anachronistic, where <laughs> they, they don't fit into the period in which they yeah. live. I mean, mm-hmm. Sarah Palin mm-hmm. was a throwback to a time before her, and almost any of these people you can mm-hmm. think of, they're all these people who don't live in the time in which the pieces are set, but they're kind of fighting to maintain that, yeah. that, that standard, that thing that, mm. that defined what they were. Dr. Evil, for example. I, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you know, I, I used to talk about both Dr. Evil and uh, Austin Powers. These, and and I'm, not, I'm the director. I'm just there serving Mike's vision in those cases. But I, I do think that I connected with those people and, and cared to sort of portray them in ways that match their level of passion. And they, they were people who were fish out of water, as you say, kind of out of their time. But they were people who would insist that you swim in the water they brought with them instead of, you know, s- succumbing and, and somehow assimilating. And again, I think that's just, I, just I admire people who are that clear about who they are and what matters to them, that they'll, they'll fight through words, through, through wit, through, through even, you know, lame jokes, if that's what it takes, to hold people's attention and maybe get them to, to ask questions, think about things, talk about things that, are, that matter. But I guess, though, I, I, I think about this because I was I had a chance to rewatch both Game Change and Recount, which are really about eras ending in front of the people as they're happening. We can see mm-hmm. that Recount is the, really the end of the, the 20th century. Mm-hmm. And th- that idea that you can sort of spark people, you can have a fair debate and work out, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> according yeah. to the Constitution, who the president should be. <laughs> and, and Game Change, too, is about these people don't realize that they've been passed passed by that kind of stalwart forcefulness that simple idea mm-hmm. can carry the day yeah that they also these people often in, in your works are these dangerous charismatics yeah well and it's also though in game change is the best like deal this because the other side of i am hypnotized or what's the right word I've, there's a spell they cast that mesmerized. i can come yeah mesmerized i can fall under it they're like cult leaders you know, and but I also very much identified in those two films with Ron Klain, who was the opposite of that, and and with with Steve Schmidt, who again the who, voices, the, the kind of the voices of common exactly. sense, who aren't being heard, and <laughs> and also the the cult members who look around and go, oh no, I'm I've got I've fallen for this, I'm into it. Should I and can I undo this now? Can I put this back in the box? Steve Schmidt, the guy who uh, whose idea it was in a way to to push for Sarah Palin as the vice presidential candidate, who was 
was responsible to some extent for vetting her and then was later responsible for trying to figure out what to do about the fact that they completely miscalculated who she was and what she was ready for. Yet he had to go with the program, you know, and so that crisis of consciousness, the soul at stake that is that person who's got to decide, do I go with this charismatic leader person who is that mesmerizing or do I connect to something that's more about justice and and fairness and wisdom? Like when does wisdom matter more than you know this cult uh, super character person that sure, cult leader. Sure, the size of, and, and that kind of chemistry and the, the spell that can cast over people. Yeah. I mean, it, it certainly even it definitely applies to the campaign. Absolutely. We're doing a film, you know, we're developing a project based on John Ronson's book, The Psychopath Test. <laughs> oh, no kidding, really? Yeah. And that is what I'm, I, I think I have become obsessed to some extent is, is there something about those narcissistic characters who are willing to commit to a, a mythology that they themselves have populated and, and set designed and, you know, whatever they, however they made their world, it's so compelling. Is there something to our world that we fall for that? Why do we fall for that? What What is it ab about that level of charisma that makes us sometimes just get in behind those people? Is it because we wish we could, you know, we long for that power? Or is it that they just make us feel like we're part of something bigger than ourselves? My guest who's doing a very articulate job in defending <laughs> his film, <laughs> which I'm not attacking, by the way, is our old friend Jay Roach, whose new film is director is Trumbo. It's The Treatment. But that the other thing, Tim, is these people are – they do at some point succumb to these these appetites for pleasure that they have. I mean, you can – we can get it. It's, it's Sarah Palin who has to have these things that she wants around her. It's it's mm -hmm. – certainly it's it's Will Ferrell's character in the, in the <laughs> campaign. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it's also even De Niro in Meet the Parents who has to have these things around him mm. that he has to have. He kind of builds his world for himself and he gets pleasure out of this. Yeah. And, and this kind of sadistic pleasure mm -hmm. in sort of like reading people <laughs> around him. Yeah. But that idea of people who are certainly as, as, as enthralled to pleasure as they are to sort of yeah. captivating people yeah. – all these things that you are interested in are, can fall equally into the sort of the, the camps of drama or comedy, can't they? Yeah, yeah because I think a, a great villain is a great villain, whether it's, you know, uh, comedy or drama. Hedda Hopper is a fantastic villain. She was so powerful and she you know and, and kind of and dangerous theatrical. but she wore yeah she wore these crazy hats you know and and would speak like uh that sort of uh, what do they call it mid mid-atlantic thing where it's half english you know like she was very affected in a, in a really interesting way had millions of readers and you know she was so she was a great villain but then dr evil is a, is an, another kind of great villain so it's i think i find that the characters that are almost delusionally uh, super powerful in their own <laughs> minds, but the difference between who they are in their own minds and what's going on for real is, you know, either makes really good drama or really good comedy. But for me, that idea of, for you, first and foremost, it's about the kind, it's about how self-possession becomes a way to dramatize a life. And, mm -hmm. and that's as important as story. And I, I, we should say, too, that this movie is thronged with, with actors like that. Uh, you've got Stephen Root, and you've got John Goodman, and you've got Louis C.K., and you've got uh, Michael, Michael Stuhlbarg, Stuhlbarg as, and, uh, as Edward G. Robinson. L John Goodman's character, Frank King, the King brothers were pinball merchants you know uh jukeboxes and peep show uh, and so and they got some money and made a, a, a little film at some point to use in one of their peep show machines that they would it was have, a, it was a, it was a basically kind of semi the schlock guys you yeah. know they made and they got money to do that and they started making low budget films and when the when the these writers were blacklisted they saw an opportunity because they could suddenly get someone like dalton trumbo who made seventy five thousand dollars a script and pay him twelve hundred dollars a script uh and so that goodman was that that much of an accidental hero by helping these blacklisted writers write in the black market, but then also takes on a union leader who's trying to shut them down, a pro-studio union leader uh, with a baseball bat. I mean, I, that is a that kind of larger-than-life thing. I do think that's what can bring spectacle to, you know, to a drama, you know, just a spectacle and comedy. It's the, it's actually one of, it's a scene that <laughs> gets even more laughs than, uh, than some of my comedy scenes, get, <laughs> comedy movie scenes get. Well, it's funny because that's, it's, 
it really, in this way, it's an intensely dramatic scene because it's yeah. about somebody yeah. standing up who refuses to be cowed by this guy who just comes in and insinuates. Doesn't he really threaten him? And yeah. part of his anger is that if you want to threaten me, come out and threaten me. Yeah. Don't, <laughs> don't try to use innuendo yeah. with me. But again, I think this is almost like in some way an apotheosis because this movie has so many larger than life characters in it. And I, there's a danger in doing something like that because you can tip the scales away from your, your protagonist. You must yeah. have to deal with that. Well, because he was, because it was always for me, what would Trumbo do? What story serves Trumbo the best? What, what range of tone? And you look at the range of, of tones of, of his, the films he did from Roman Holiday, which is such a beautiful, simple little romantic comedy with well, Audrey that, Hepburn's first film with, with Gregory Peck. Gregory Peck and, and, but also with a tragic ending. A tra- tragic ending, but a bittersweet kind of tragic ending. She's, she's grown from it, and so is he. And, they, and then you, you go to The Brave One, which is about a boy and, and his pet bull, bull who's doomed to go and have to be killed in a bullfight. Yeah, I was just saying that, 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 uh, that, that sort of people getting close to the dream and then having it dissipate before them yeah. runs through almost everyone in the scripts is certainly the case in Johnny Got His Gun Absolutely. Which, which I was wondering if, that, if there was ever any conversation about finding a way to get that into the film at all you know we we show the book briefly yeah. um, he tried for so long to get the film made and he made the film after our story so it was, it wasn't it, we definitely had to establish that he'd been a successful novelist before but I think again that the tone of his writing was expanded. I mean, he. I also really strongly recommend people not only read the biography this is based on, and there's a new biography by Chris Trumbo and Larry Suppler, but the book of letters that he wrote called Additional Dialogue. He wrote these very impassioned, intense letters to his family from jail and to his enemies, and but he wrote a letter to his son about. Uh, he said, I'm sending you two books. His first year in college. One's about gambling. You'll make a ton of money from your friends. Don't tell them you have the book. They'll be pissed off if you find out about it. The other one is about the guilt of sex. And there's a particular chapter about the guilt of masturbation, which I must admit I suffered as a young man from, from early on. Um, but please read this and, and, uh, and don't feel bad. And I'm um, signed uh, from the masturbator's masturbator, your father, Dalton Trumbo. <laughs> And I was like, this man, he was so, he was such a humanist. And you could call him every other thing, you know, but a humanist would be what I would have put on his tombstone. He cared about people and he cared about the whole range of, of existence, including really funny stuff. Uh, and because all his friends were very funny too, and they would, you know, skewer each other all the time. So I, I couldn't not have comedy in it. You know, it's a very serious film and there's only a few comedic moments. But I needed people who had a sense of irony and could get at the absurdities of this crazy thing that happened. You know, it was insane. Hedda Hopper was a ridiculous figure, you know. And so you had to have Louis C.K., uh, you know, around to to sort of really cut to the heart of that. And, and people like John Goodman and, and, and Brian Cranston, who was really, really great dramatic actor, but an incredibly good comedic actor as well. And th- does that thing where, you know, confuse sort of the comic and the tragic? Because we talked when the f- you were first here about, for me, how a lot of Austin Powers, the first film, is really tragic. <laughs> yeah. When Austin uh, tries to flash a peace sign to the, the hipsters, you know, in Vegas in 1997, you know, yeah, it, he was a he was a tra- tragic figure in a way because he didn't realize how outmoded his sexual mores way, were. And I think, I, obviously, it's such a cliche to say it, but I think, you know, all good comedies have something tragic in them and some pain in them, and all good dramas have have elements of absurdity and wit. Uh, otherwise, they, you know, they either would get too sort of monochromatic. Great words to leave with, because we're out of time. I can't thank you enough for doing this, Jay. Really, thank you. Oh, uh, thanks for having me. I, mean, I love talking with you always. Thanks. Thanks, Elvis. Still on hip. So, um, <laughs> by the way, please see Trumbo, my guest. This is director, Jay Rush. We never have enough time to talk about the things we should get into. You have to come back anytime you want. There's always an invitation to you to come back here. Thank you very much. That means a lot. My pleasure. Our technical director here at NPR West is Marcia Conwell. The show is mixed by Kat Yor. It's edited by Blake Fight, who's the associate producer. I'm still on hip. It's the treatment. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> catch up on past episodes of The Treatment, go to kcrw.com or listen on your smartphone with KCRW's mobile apps or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or if you listen to podcasts. The Treatment is produced and distributed by KCRW Santa Monica. That don't beat.